Hello, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. I have an interesting inquiry. It says, I hear so much about people having stress and burnout and trauma. We didn't used to hear words like that. Is it uh, that we didn't have the words? Uh, were people different about society? Well, how would all the above sound to you as an answer? Uh, each generation selects special words, and you probably remember most of us can as teenagers, young kids, we made up words to so we could have our own conversation and think that the, the grown-ups wouldn't know what we were talking about. Well, that's sort of like uh, some of these words that get into the cycle babble, these fancy words that are used for clinical uses. There's even a word to, uh, for making up new words, and it's called uh, argot. Yeah, it comes from silver, the silver tongue. Uh, we didn't used to talk much about burnout. We uh, didn't talk about stress. Stress was just expected. If you had it, well, you're supposed to deal with it. If something happened to you, you're supposed to go ahead and with your life. We took it for granted because in those days, survival was the name of the game. People were supposed to, to handle what came along. Um, trauma was something that used special purpose when people got hurt. And you remember getting hurt, we were talking about uh, falling off a horse, getting thrown off a horse. If you got thrown, you're supposed to get back on or develop a pattern so that you didn't become afraid to ride. That's the same thing. Now that originated, that idea was first formalized at least, uh, I've read, by Napoleon's army. And it became part of the pattern for the military after that three words if you got wounded, traumatized, disabled. It was immediacy, proximity, and expectation. In other words, you got hurt, treated immediately. Proximity was treated right there. And the expectation was to go back on duty, go back in whatever you were doing. It was riding a horse or soldiers in battle. You're supposed to go right back in. In those days, uh, people didn't uh, didn't have much patience for what's called shell shock later. Uh, burnout, we didn't know about. We didn't have the luxury of calling 911 uh, for every injury. You know, I've been on over a thousand ambulance calls, which is not very many for a city, but it's quite a few for a little hamlets. And I've, uh, I've watched and wondered about some of these things because People call 911 for a lot of things that uh, we wouldn't do that in the past. Of course, today people are living longer and they're healthier, so I'm not uh, saying we shouldn't call 911. Of course not. But it is a fairly new term. Some people use burnout uh, for fatigue. They should say, I'm tired. Instead, I hear people say, well, I'm burned out. Say, what do you mean by burned out? Uh, I've never seen burnout from overwork, the psychological phrase, the psychiatric phrase of burnout. I've never seen it from overwork. What I see it from uh, most often, and I think I've commented on this before, is uh, when people lose the why they're doing something. People are doing something and they it's no longer interesting, they lose interest in it, or it's not going anywhere, the person feels that it's a dead-end job, or the job is simply to uh, to fill in time. Well, people talk about that as burnout, but that's, that's not burnout. Uh, people ought to switch something else. There's another word, uh, anime. I see this oftentimes. It's a fairly seldom used word, anomia or anome, A-N-O-M-I-E, and it means normlessness, valuelessness. Uh, there's no purpose. And this is what I see oftentimes with people. 
that they have no particular goal, they have no particular purpose, they have no particular values. You think about our society right now, we have a great deal going on that would suggest that uh, we have a value deficit, we are in a society lacking significant values, and uh, we're moving more and more into an unclear pattern. The things that were going on when we were children, people my age were children, there are no new sins, there are no new wrongdoings, but we had a much better idea, a much clearer idea of what was right and wrong than young people today. Young people today, because of their adult people who are in charge of them are setting up a society where the, the boundaries are quite unclear compared to what they used to be. And I think that's a serious problem. That's the valuelessness, normlessness pattern. You know, as a follow-up on that, <coughs> we, uh, we see this sort of pattern, valuelessness, normlessness, and uh, what do you do about it? Well, we should find something to believe in, a very real need to believe in something of substance and to have meaning, have meaning in our life. And I think uh, if we look at it, every one of us seems to have a need for a philosophy. And uh, the philosophy of so many young people today is, eh, so what? Go with the flow. That's the philosophy, to go with the flow. A quest for mediocrity, in a sense, to be in the middle. Uh, don't struggle, don't try to achieve anything. Just go with the flow and be one of the group. <clears throat> Somewhere in, in the middle, yeah, most people get along okay. They're somewhere between the past and the future, called present. Most people don't uh, think very much about what they believe in. They think about things of believing. Basically, people are born, you feed them, they reproduce, they die. That's the cycle. And most people don't think very much in depth about much of anything. Uh, they become whatever they are, mostly because that's what their parents set up for them. For example, you could probably find that most Democrats are Democrats because their parents were most Republicans and so on, whatever the politics. Same thing about religion. People generally are whatever their parents are. They don't give a great deal of thought to, well, why am I whatever I claim to be, if I claim to be something? You know, oftentimes the people who talk about burnout, they never had a fire to start with. It's a little hard to say they burned out. They didn't really stand for anything. <clears throat> and if you stand for something, and I recommend it what all societies all over the world throughout history, find a religion. Believe in it. Follow it. That's what most people do. But to try to say there is no religion except for materialism today, consumerism, that seems to be what so many people are doing, <coughs> uh, that doesn't seem to work well. That doesn't seem to work for most people. Most people do better if they really believe in something and uh, care about it. <coughs> Too many people try to go through life without showing they care. They're trying to avoid making commitments. If they're making commitments, then they're afraid, well, they're going to be disappointed. There's something going to happen. I find that uh, so many people, they, they think they're living in the fast lane, they're doing all kinds of things, but they don't know why. They seem to be ahead of schedule, but they don't know where they're going, as some of the jokes, uh, stories go. <coughs> working hard, working many hours, but what's the purpose? They, as the saying goes, they haven't taken time to smell the roses. They haven't taken time to really think about what they're doing as they go through life. Well, that's part of it. To make a commitment, to have something. <clears throat> we have a counter uh, 
comments from a lot of people say, well, don't we have the highest standard of living right now that we've ever had or we're better off than we've ever been? Uh, and that's a paradox. That's sort of the enigma. That's the puzzle. Yes, indeed. According to what standard of living you're talking about, yes, materially we have never been better health-wise <coughs> due to modern medicines and antibiotics. Uh, we have people living longer. <coughs> People aren't subjected to a lot of the uh, dangers they used to have in industry and work. Um, but I, I would guess that most of you have done what I did the other day. I took a slow walk through the mall, the North Mall down in Plattsburgh. <clears throat> I was looking in the shops. I became very interested. <coughs> Excuse me. You know what I saw in those shops? Same thing you do. I saw a bunch of nothing. Most of those shops are filled with fluff, not necessities. People loaded with these things, they build these malls on a temporary basis, they don't expect the buildings to last. The shops are there with whatever is attractive at the moment, and what will sell, but for what purpose? As I meandered through the mall and looking at all these things, they weren't necessities. So people are working very hard today and putting in long hours to fill in the want basket. What they want, not what they need. Uh, they remind me of a couple I've worked with not too long ago. Just listening to them, they talked about spending $600 per child on toys. And these people aren't well off. But as I listened to them, the whole pattern, $600. They don't even have a place to put those toys. They're stacking them up. Children can't play with toys like that. They have a room, a wall full of toys. Some people are surprised when children come along and uh, play with the boxes and have more fun playing with the boxes than some of the toys because they can use their imagination with a box. Children have a need for that. Mm -hmm. But it's just giving that as an example of materialism. Work, 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 work. And why? To buy $600 worth of toys that are going to be... Uh, outdated tomorrow. <clears throat> New toys, of course the toy manufacturers are very happy with that. They do great. Well, here's another question. <clears throat> Excuse me, on Dateline, I think that's an NBC program, uh, one of these news magazine programs. The uh, question has to do with the uh, book, The Surrendered Wife. And the question is, am I familiar with that? Yes. And the criticism was that uh, surrendered wife means a throwback. Going back to the old uh, macho days when a man ruled everything. Well, that really is not what the book is about. The book is about becoming oneself fully in the role of being a wife. And... Uh, I recommend the same thing for husbands, to become thoroughly enmeshed with the job, so to speak, of being a husband, being a father, being a wife, being a mother. Surrendering to that primary role in life is healthy, it's wholesome, it's good for the family. It's not uh, just giving in. I'm well aware that people sometimes need micromanaging. But there are too many people running around who are trying to micromanage. They're telling the other one all the details. What to do. Do this, do that. Be sure to take the trash out. Take the trash out, wash your hands. When you get through with that, put a new whatever container. Uh, on and on and on. As if the person doing the job couldn't do the job. You listen to people you know. Listen to couples, you know. Some of them are really micromanagers, aren't they? Some people need to have that kind of thing. Most people don't. 
and it's the same for husband or wife. <clears throat> I don't recommend that style at all. It's an interesting kind of pattern. <clears throat> Most people uh, know what to do. It's kind of like we see so many children today. They don't uh, mind the first time. They don't do what they're asked the first time because they fully expect to be asked several more times. Well, <clears throat> husbands and wives do the same thing, don't they? Well, until another time, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Have a good day. <clears throat>
If they say they're going to decide for themselves, that's a cop-out because they're not able to think through. Just like most adults, adults haven't stopped to think through what their religion is and what it is that's likable or not likable, what's believable and what's not believable, what are the shoulds and should not. Most adults haven't thought through very much about their religion. So, determine how much latitude you're going to give. At what age would the child be old enough to decide for himself? I think about 16, frankly. Uh, that would be my answer. At that age, the child has enough mental maturity, cognitive maturity, the nervous system has developed so that the child can really think through the different concepts of religion, the different ideologies, if he wants to. But in the meantime, just go. Here's another one. It says I'm an old timer. I don't understand why boys and some men insist on wearing their caps indoors. Uh, can you help me understand that? I wish I could. Uh, I have opinions. If you're an old timer, you know that the hat the cap used to be a symbol of authority. And uh, it's still a badge. For example, uniforms. A police officer has a cap or a hat they wear. <coughs> they're not fully in uniform unless they're wearing it. And it's supposedly the badge of authority. So I think this thing about wearing uh, hats and caps indoors came in about uh, oh, 65, 66. The Graduate, the movie The Graduate was about the time I'm thinking about where it was a movie about uh, overthrowing things that uh, society stood for uh, and wearing a cap or hat inside is one of those badges. In fact, a few days ago I saw several men wearing a hat in a church building. Now, they, they weren't in the, uh, in the sanctuary proper. They were in church building, and some of us have commented about it. You know, that we didn't used to see. These people didn't even think about it. Uh, it is a uh, badge of authority, and I saw it starting schools. I was aware of it going on when people were letting, and teachers letting uh, the boys wear their baseball caps in school. And some of them, I remember when I was instructing college prof, and they started they wanted to wear their caps in class. And uh, they pulled that bill down in front of them, and they uh, supposedly could cheat on exams, and you wouldn't see them. So I stopped that immediately the first time I saw it. There'd be no caps, whatever. Mm. But if it's a badge of authority, so what? Is it hurt it? Does it hurt anything? Well, it offends old people. Older people are usually offended. Some people come right in and it's just a habit, they take the hat off indoors. The military is that way. The military had certain rules. If you were on duty, carrying out a function, you were supposed to wear your hat. Uh, but if you were not, then you were supposed to be uncovered, as they said. I think that uh, is the answer. Uh, like to hear you have a different answer. I'd like to hear from you. Here's another one. It says I'm having trouble with my stepsons and feel terrible when they say you're not my mom, you're not our mom. We don't have to mind you. What can I do? Well, first thing I suggest is y'all yeah, admit it. You're not the mom. Then get with the father and clarify what is your authority. What's really being expected of you? Uh, so many times these blended families, step families, nobody ever talks about, well, what will the role be of stepmother, stepfather? How much authority will I have? Am I authorized to discipline or not? Should I or should I not? 
So first thing is to get with the other parent. Sometimes the biological parent said, no, 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 I want you to take care of the children, but uh, you don't discipline. I'll do that. Well, that's okay most of the time. Sometimes that seems to impose a problem. So first get with the other parent, the biological parent. Find out what your role is expected to be. Clarify it. Have it well understood between the two of you. Then bring in the boys, in this case boys, bring in the stepchildren, and have a group discussion. Let the questions flow. But uh, unless you have a good reason, stick to whatever you and the other parent have agreed to. Say, this is how it would be. This is what's going to happen. And then let it go. That's what it'll be. And then follow that from then on. And true, step-parent is never the biological parent. Don't pretend to be. Which brings in the question sometimes, well, what should stepchildren call the step-parent? Why not have it agreed beforehand? What do you want to be called? Sometimes uh, the children feel caught in a bind because if they call somebody mother, are they being disloyal to their real mother or father? Are they being disloyal? So you might pick a name that's, uh, that's acceptable to you and uh, go with it. It's not going to be a big troublesome. See, it's a problem, and it's very common, and it's becoming more so. Uh, they really get fouled up. I see people in the situation uh, of this one where they are a step parent, and then what happens? The spouse takes off, leaves the step parent with the stepchildren. Happening more and more, and uh, people shouldn't do that. Uh, well, parents don't have a right to mess up kids' lives, but they certainly seem to be exercising that authority as if they had the right to do it, and <clears throat> it gets to be troublesome indeed. Here's another one: said so I've just turned 80. See, a lot of people turning 80 these days. Is it too late to start mental gymnastics? Well, obviously somebody who's 80 and uses terminology like mental gymnastics is on the ball. The answer is no. It's never too late. You use your brain or lose it. We used to say that applied to muscles. Use a muscle or lose it. That's nature's way of conserving energy. By the way, you can find it in trees. If you want to make a tree limb stronger, exercise it. Um, same thing about the body and the brain. I would suggest for an 80-year-old, good thing to do is a crossword puzzle. Some people like that. Some people like art, uh, or designing, or painting. Uh, something that's physically easy to do. But do something that you really like to do. Don't make work out of it. Don't make a chore out of it. And hopefully get somebody to enjoy it with you. Find somebody who's interested in the same thing. Doesn't have to be the same age, but somebody who uh, likes to do what you want to do or learn to do. There's another thing. Why not take a course at any state college in New York? You can take courses free. Now, if you want credit for them, you have to pay for tuition. But if you uh, if you want to just go sit in a class, just name your class. If there's space available in the classroom and it doesn't disrupt the class, and that's up to the instructor. State law says you're entitled to go to any class you want to go to. Paid your money, you paid the taxes, you supported them. So <clears throat> try it. You may find it very exciting. I know as a college prof, I had people from time to time who were, they called them senior citizens. <coughs> they were fun. There's even some federal programs called Elder Hostel. Uh, it was supposedly to reach out to those people who didn't have opportunities for education, but what it really amounted is 
to, and, and I think it still works that way, is people who were well educated and wanted to have an interest. They should go two weeks to a college in the summertime. Excuse me, it's typically in the summer. <coughs> two weeks, boarding room, very low expense, uh, and attend classes. Special classes set up for them. <coughs> and they have fun. And some people make this their vacation. They go place to place. I've known people I taught in it for 11 years or something. Uh, there are people who just travel around the country, going from college to college, and they have a great time meeting people, learning new things. <coughs> it's, a, it's a fun thing. I don't think it serves the purpose that it was set out to do. It serves another purpose. I know I've had people in those elder hostel classes with PhDs and law degrees and things like that, people who were really enjoying it, but it wasn't because they needed that sort of thing to compensate for the lack of opportunities when they were young people. Uh, gerontology is interesting. I remember in my baccalaureate degree work, uh, another guy, he and I were competing. We were going to we were going to be the honor student. One of us was, we thought, the valedictorian and all that sort of thing. Well, we didn't pay any attention to that little woman who just walked around and she became the valedictorian. She was 72 at the time, I remember. I remember her name. She's a little French woman, Miss Michaud, but she had lived in Russia. A very interesting person. Very quietly, just walked off with the top grade. She got the best of all of us. <clears throat> you know, in, uh, in gerontology, um, old people, we're not using the same brain cells. We grow new ones as we need them. So it's always an opportunity to learn. Until another time, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Have a good one. Hello, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. I have a question that says, uh, our two-year-old sucks his thumb, and my grandma says we shouldn't let him do that. Because uh, it's he's nervous is why he does it. Uh, how do we break the pattern? Well, did your grandma tell you how to break the pattern? Bet she has several remedies. But uh, that was something we used to worry about. I know when I started off as a psychology student, I had all kinds of good explanations. But you know, it's been found that uh, babies suck the thumb because it's there. You find that when you see sonograms of unborn babies, some of them are sucking their thumbs in the womb enjoying it. Not because they've had a neurotic life, it isn't because as a used to try to teach us that uh, the child was frustrated, all kinds of things going on in the child's life. <sighs> the best thing to do is don't worry about it. Now, if it does it a certain way and for a certain length of time can cause buck teeth, but that can be corrected too. And I'm not talking about going to the orthodontist. There are several commercial products that you can put on a thumb. It's Persuade your kids pretty quickly not to suck their thumb. But don't worry about it as being something neurotic. It's not. The child sucks the thumb because it's there. <coughs> Here's a question. It says our oldest son's always bossing the other children around. Whenever he, he is at home, wherever he's at school, daycare, what can be done? Uh, well, why does he do it? What does he get out of it? Have you watched? Have you looked at him? Is he older? Is he bigger than the other children? Uh, if he does this at home, is he given praise and benefit for doing this at home? For example, uh, so many parents very logically expect the older child to look after the younger child. Very logical. That's not a fault. It doesn't mean people shouldn't do that. But uh, some older children uh, take that job very seriously and want to do things. 
They want to be helpful. Uh, it's called the eldest child syndrome, and it works very well. Sometimes even when uh, the parents would rather they didn't, eldest child syndrome, for example, works uh, in divorces and separations or when a parent dies, the eldest child will typically take over. Well, there are numerous people in society where this has happened. Uh, so look at it. And why not ask the youngster? Maybe he's doing something he thinks he's supposed to do. Uh, maybe he's uh, copying you. Uh, maybe he's been patted on the back and said, good job, I'm glad you took care of your little brother. He saved his life or something. You know, kids do that. And then they'll go on doing the same thing. So rather than looking at it as something bad, think about it as something logical and natural for that youngster, but uh, don't let him overdo it to the point of uh, being a dictator for the young ones. Why not ask him? Good way to find out. Uh, here's one. It says my daughter is studying psychology. It says my back pain is a result of psychosomatic tension, psychosomatic ailments. Uh, and then it's all in my head. Could that be? Well, your back pain is probably in your back. It's probably not in your head. We say things like that because uh, the uh, interpretation of our body sensations is in our brain. And typically we think of that as in the head. But <clears throat> there's no such thing as artificial pain. It took a long time for uh, medicine to find that out, psychiatry. But uh, if people hurt, they hurt. Uh, take that for granted. Now, there could be many reasons why you have a back pain. Tension might be one of them, may be true. But uh, that doesn't mean that the pain's not there. Tension can cause uh, all sorts of things, but what that really usually gets into is muscle spasms. Uh, like a Charlie horse. The extreme of uh, tension is a Charlie horse. You can have a a uh, very specific kind of pain, very painful. So, <clears throat> if you hurt, you hurt. If it's something uh, that's long-lasting, back pains are very difficult to diagnose, I'm told. I read, as probably you have too, that back pains uh, typically are chronic. You hurt your back, you may not be able to strengthen it again so that it's always subject to being hurt again, but try it. See what you can do. Might be go to a physician, take exercise pattern. There are all kinds of ways of getting over it. And don't think unkindly about your daughter who's studying psychology. We used to call it a sophomore syndrome. When kids got to the level in their college work where they were studying pathology, illnesses. Then they attribute all the illnesses to everybody and to themselves. They read through them, but that's just a stage psychology students go through. They'll get over it. <coughs> Excuse me, here's another one. It says, I'm a soccer mom and I'm exhausted. Did our mothers stay this busy? Heavens no. You remember the days, probably if you have, if you don't, you, you read about them, and if you don't remember them, ask your grandparents. Urban housewives used to have get together in uh, on the block, coffees in the morning. They weren't running around, dashing around all the time. Schools have added a great burden to these people. I know families, I see them all the time, these soccer moms, whether it's soccer, basketball, whatever it is. Talking to somebody last night, one child was in a game playing in one town, another child was in a game playing in another town, and another one was home. And the parents were talking about, uh, well, we had to make rules. This, this particular set of parents said, we always go to the oldest child's game. 
the rule we have. Because the next one will come along and we'll go to that one. So it'll be fair in the long run. I thought, well, that's a pretty good idea. <clears throat> but no, it's, it's, it's kind of sad in a way how busy some parents are these days. Going everywhere, trying to do everything. And <clears throat> I saw a commercial the other day. This reminds me. Maybe some of you have seen it. I think it was a commercial about some investment company. A group of people, some parents and some grandparents watching, I think it's a little league, and they're all thinking about the investment. And the investment managers, and I think it was Payne Weber, I'm not sure, but I thought, how sad. All these people are at the game, and none of them are thinking about the kids in the game. They're all thinking about their investments. So why are they at the game? What are they doing there? Are they there to show the child, look, I brought my body here so you know I really care about you. But I'm not thinking about you. I'm not here for you, I'm here yeah, just because I'm supposed to be. I thought, what a sad commercial. But I'm a guess <clears throat> that most people didn't see that in that commercial, but that's how it struck me. Here's another one. It says, I read that most people have a sleep deficit sleep deficit. Why is that? Because hmm. they're working. They're busy. Like the previous question. I find it puzzling that we have all the labor-saving devices in the home. All these fancy gadgets to save us work. And people aren't sleeping enough. I've read this. I've read it uh, often and seen studies on it. But it's kind of kind of sad, isn't it? That's why a lot of people are working to buy these things to save them work, save them time. And they're putting in extra time on the job to buy these things. Perhaps they didn't need in the first place. My wife wouldn't like it, but uh, we have a dishwasher. I don't even like to use it. I don't use it. Just two of us at home now. Why use a dishwasher? It makes sense to me. But uh, that's the way it is. People aren't sleeping enough. <clears throat> it's been found that uh, on average people need eight hours sleep. It's also been found that on average working age people are usually getting less than that. <coughs> I I used to think when I was a youngster that sleep was uh, unnecessary. I thought, how sad. When I was that way, well, I was a youngster, and then I got over it. I'm pretty good at sleeping these days. I don't think I have a sleep deficit, but uh, I know I used to when I was a youngster. Here's another question. Says my HMO is willing to pay for consultation and counseling, uh, but the counselor we went to says no. He won't follow the uh, the paperwork that that company requires because it requires a psychiatric diagnosis. And the counselor said, "I don't have one." Uh, is that reasonable? Yes. There are a lot of insurance companies that are paying for all sorts of things, but the typical insurance form requires a diagnosis to be made. And they don't like it if you say there is no psychiatric diagnosis, most of them. They want something that's treatable. They want something then that can be measured as to how much progress is made in so many sessions. Um, I find that, so I go along with it. For example, not long ago I had uh, somebody referred to me by EAP, these Employment Assistance Program people, for marriage counseling. Well, the same party who referred uh, somebody to me for marriage counseling referred the spouse to another counselor and therapist. 
that's not the way to do marriage counseling. If you want to do marriage counseling, marriage problems are about the relationship. You don't have to be sick to have a problem in your relationship. You don't have to have a, have to have a psychiatric diagnosis. To have a problem that you and your spouse don't agree or don't get along about something, it may be that uh, indeed for some things you shouldn't agree. It doesn't mean that you have to be sick about it. So it, it's kind of sad that people are trying to do the right things, but I thought it was kind of kind of backwards. Here, this HMO fancy company sent all this paperwork to me and come find out the spouse had gone to see somebody else who didn't agree with me that the marriage uh, is quite salvageable. I thought the people who had a good chance of getting over it problems, but that's what's going on sometimes with HMOs. Uh, they're set up to make money and set up to program and streamline treatment patterns. Some people don't need treatment for an ailment that's not there. Here's a question. It's rather interesting. I uh, I thought about it. it. Says, how much time does it take to rear a child? I thought about that. It takes what you have, doesn't it? it may take a lifetime. And some of us old great grandparents may think we're not through yet when we see the behavior of our children. You know, there's no office where you turn in your resignation for being a parent. You're always a parent. And we always have an interest in children. Oh, sure, we're supposed to learn when to back off and when not to do certain things. And most of us can do that. But uh, it doesn't mean we don't still have an interest. So it may take five minutes of undivided time a day. It may take eight or ten hours. Depends on the child, the age, all kinds of things. How much time does it take to rear a child? It's sort of like the expression, if you have to ask, you can't afford it. If you're the kind of person who thinks you can rear a child with X number of minutes a day, well, maybe the child hasn't read the same book. Maybe the child isn't uh, aware that on a certain day nauseated, vomiting, diarrhea. Well, that's not on your schedule. Well, hmm, what are you supposed to do about it? Sometimes it takes a long time, all the hours in a day. And sometimes it doesn't take near enough. You're so pleased with what the children do, what they stand for, what they seem to be becoming that the time invested just seems to melt away. So how much time does it take to rear a child? Whatever you have, what you're willing to give. But use it wisely. Um, here's a question. <clears throat> is which in-law is likely to be the most troublesome? In-law. <clears throat> well, since time began, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of laws and regulations, the mother-in-law and daughter-in-law have been the ones that had the most problems because they're basically in the same business. They're running households, they're running families, that's the way it has been. Um, but in-laws have a very important role to play. Most of the time, mm, the jokes are all about mothers-in-law, <clears throat> but the mother-in-law is the same sweet old grandmother. So sometimes it's a role that, that people play, rather important. Until another time, I'm Dr. John Middleton, Family Life in the North Country. Have a good day. <laughs>